Boom, what's up everybody? It's mind pump time. All right, we're gonna give away in today's episode a free intuitive nutrition guide. This is where we talk to people about how to get their bodies healthy and lean the right way, the sustainable way through behaviors, not necessarily through metrics. So here's how you can win an intuitive nutrition guide. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. If we pick your comment as the best comment, you'll get that for free. Also, uh, we are running a sale. MAPS Aesthetic and our Extreme Fitness Bundle are both 50% off. You can go check them out, learn more, or just sign up at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code MAYSPECIAL with no space for the discount. Uh, I know you're going to enjoy this podcast. Here we go. All right, guys. Uh, I want to bring something up right now that I think needs to be talked about. Is this like a What's come, that? come yeah. to Jesus for somebody? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, it's not like no, that. No, there's this new kind of like uh, segment of the fitness industry that's starting to gain some traction. And I'm starting to see articles written in this fashion or you know, with this kind of uh, philosophy or belief system around uh, fitness and health. And it's kind of it's starting to creep into you know what we do, and what I mean by that is it, at first it was kind of small and like nobody cared, right. but now it's getting a little bit more mainstream, and it, I think it's very dangerous in the sense that it's not going to help anybody. It's actually going to hurt so quite a bit. Curious where you're going? Yeah. Right so there was this article that was in the Washington Post. In fact, I, I uh, did a post about it on my Instagram. It's called uh, Five Myths About Obesity." Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you stirred it up a little bit with that. I did, and I read it, and it's. I couldn't believe, I mean, I, I, part of me is like, I can't believe what they're saying. The other part of me is like, okay, well, this is just kind of the direction that it seems uh, things are going. So I'll, I'll, tell you a I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. I'll read a couple of things so you guys can hear, you know, kind of get an idea. Mm -hmm. So one of the myths that they put in there, I think it was the first myth, if I'm not mistaken, is that obesity results from lifestyle choices. So that's a, that's a myth. According mm. to this, <laughs> oh, it's a myth. Yeah, that's a myth. There's no said. way that can happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. According to this, and it says right. in this article, and and again, this is what makes it so dangerous. Is they position it like it's science and like this is the truth, right? Mm. But here's part of that that segment. It says most up to date research indicates that the causes of obesity are complex and cannot be explained solely by choices, uh, by solely by calories in and out based on diet and exercise, calorie absorption, or energy derived from consumed food varies among individuals and is determined not only by portion size at mealtime, but by factors such as gut microbes, hormones, digestive enzymes, and nerve signals. When it comes to burning calories, metabolism is a major player, and there is growing evidence that genetics, sleep deprivation, medication, stress, and even the environment a, a person was exposed to in utero can contribute to unhealthy weight gain. So there's that part, right? You gotta love that right there. Right? Let's throw some buzzwords around Ugh. so I sound like we know what it's we're talking about. Verbal well, diarrhea is well, what and, it sounds like to me. And a lot of the stuff that they're saying is 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 also choice, right? Hormones. My hormones are off. Well, your lifestyle affects that quite a bit. Digestive enzymes, microbes, like a, a lot of that is your well, lifestyle. And, well, and here's where I mean, where an article like this probably goes viral is that everything they're saying is not not true either. Right, like that. Yeah, all, it is all, complex. Yeah, all, right. it is complex. All those things do mm -hmm. uh, affect it, but to just discount that uh, your choice and your behaviors have nothing to do with it is right. It's, it takes the responsibility part out. Yes, yes. So here's another part of it, right? The here's another myth, and I think this was like number three, right? This is the the myth that they put: dieting and exercise will reverse severe obesity. That's a myth. Apparently, <laughs> and now, now, in, in, in this is something we talk about. Well, okay, yeah, again, I'm, I'm gonna play like them. So, why you do this? I'm gonna pretend like them. Uh, it's failed, right? It's failed for the last three decades yeah. in a row. We've been trying to, we've there's hundreds, there's thousands of diets out there, there's thousands of programs and routines out there. Obesity continues to be on the rise, yes. therefore. If that supposedly is the answer, it's not working. That's what makes it so dangerous. Mm, what right. makes it so dangerous is they'll take some truth that's and right. then they'll twist it in a way that absolves everybody of any uh, empowerment. Right? We can play this game. So here's what they say mm. in there. There is growing evidence that diet and exercise alone are ineffective at decreasing and maintaining a lower BMI, mm. particularly for people with severe obesity, defined as BMI of 40 or more. In fact, weight loss causes hunger to increase and metabolism to slow down which can lead to weight regain. Most of the contestants on The Biggest Loser have ended up gaining a significant amount of weight back, which we've talked which about many times. about. So this makes me, this. I'll give you an example of kind of what they're doing, right? So we have a door to our studio uh, and we can go in and out. And if I want to open the door 
from the inside, I have to open, I have to pull it in, right? Mm. But let's say I go and turn the doorknob and push, and then I just keep pushing, and then I come back and be like, Doors the, broken. Doors don't work. Yeah. <laughs> doors don't work. You can't go from one room to another without a door. Tell right? me I'm wrong. Yes. So uh, they're not wrong in the sense that the biggest loser people gain their weight back. And they're, not, that. they're not wrong that we're fa- we're failing, right? Yes, yes. Right. But it's not because diet and exercise are, are, are don't work. It's because the wrong approach with diet and exercise, which yes. I mean, we built our entire podcast off of that you know, lead to this kind of thing, right? So, and then one more thing that's kind of a part of this culture that we're starting to see now start to permeate uh, the fitness industry. So it kind of sounds like it's not related, but it is. So there's this page on Instagram and and I don't know this person. They might be a very nice person. I have no idea who they are, but I got tagged on their thing. And then I looked in their posts and I couldn't believe some of the stuff that I was reading. Uh, Her name is, and she seems like she's smart. uh, Fear, this is the name of her Instagram. Fierce Fat Femme. That's the name of it. Fierce Fat Femme. Femme spelled F-E-M-M-E, right? Okay. And there's a post that says, not not finding fatness attractive is not just a preference. It's fat phobia. <laughs> so <that's>, oh, <laughs> she, she can't have preferences anymore. Yeah. 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 Now, could you, now, okay. And then on the whole thing, <laughs> listen, I'll read some of this. It's like, I read this and I was like, what? 3,000 likes. This is uh, Woke Fitness, bro. 100%. I mean, woke Fitness is here. What? It, it's an 100%. ideology. Yes. So, and I read now, here's, listen to the first part of the post underneath it. If you're only dating or fucking or being attracted to a certain look, mm. there's a good chance that you're participating in a harmful ideology. Wow. The excuse of saying that I'm just not attracted to fat people is over and done with. What does that statement even mean? Why are you not attracted to fatness? Is it, ready for this, is it systemic ideologies and biases? Is it anti-fat stigma? If we aren't attracted to our own fatness, we should be asking why. Mm. These questions deserve some clear introspective reflection and time to chew on. And then it goes on into more. Right. More and more stuff. Now, was that, an, art- signal was that an article too, or are you just reading a post? No, right? that's her post. Okay. But she's got a lot of followers. I mean, oh. that, what I just read right there, and there's more to it, and it gets way crazier, and I don't feel like going into it. Mm. 3,000 likes. Mm-hmm. There were 3,000 people that read that and were like, yeah. Well, there was a few people I saw, not very many, because I thought you, I thought the way you presented uh, your post was uh, was perfect and clear. But you did, you know, ruffle a couple of feathers. I did see some people on there that, yeah, you know, you're not a mental expert. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I mean, I want to be really clear. You know, all the three of us built our our career around our passion for helping yes. people, and you know, we all trained a lot of people who struggled. I mean, the majority of the people that I trained struggled with obesity. And, uh, I have a lot of empathy for that struggle. It is hard. It is not easy. Mm -hmm. And all people deserve dignity and respect. I don't care if you're obese or thin or an alcoholic or whatever, you know, uh, of course, if you treat people terribly, you steal from them, you hurt people. That's a different story. But if you have your own struggles and we all have them, by the way, and here's the challenge with obesity, Obesity is so visible, right? Like you, you can't necessarily see someone struggle with their own relationships or maybe their finances or maybe another substance because you can't really tell. Right. But it's somebody that struggles with food and activity and body image issues mm. and they're obese, it's very visible. It makes them easy targets. Yeah, you, can, you, can, you can be a functioning alcoholic and people not even know, but you can't be a functioning food addict and people not know. Yeah, people will see it yeah, and then they, yeah. they're easily targeted and people are often very mean and cruel, and and I, I, I'm so opposed to that. I think that's terrible, and that only contributes to the problem. So I have a lot of empathy, but also uh, it, what doesn't help the situation is to uh, lie about it and yeah. and tell people um, you have no responsibility in this. You right. know, you, you this is not your fault, and just just and it's great. You're fine. It's all awesome. There's no issues uh, with with how you're the living. The irony for me is, I feel like as society has tried really hard to base it more around scientific principles. And it feels like we've completely started to move away from that and, and, and disregard empirical data and, you know, scientific practices that are sound because now it doesn't fit our personal narrative of what I want personally. And yeah, totally. I, it, it's, it's almost like you're, what you're trying to do is you're, and it's a very effective strategy. Like if you take, I mean, look at my kids, for example, if my, my son is starts to flunk out on his classes and I sit him down and I go, listen, buddy, it's not your fault. 
this this not your this is not you know you did nothing wrong even though i know maybe he was lazy he didn't study hard or whatever don't worry you know this is you have no responsibility in this just and you're awesome and this is great and don't worry about it i am be setting him up for failure yeah. by the way even if it was hard for him the way i would tell him is i know it was a struggle i know it was hard Here's the reality. It's no one's responsibility but yours. You well, know, you, you have to do something about it. That whole this. message of struggle, like we know the value of struggle. We know that the journey is everything that, you know, you going through that struggle is where you learn everything and how you're able to handle uh, any kind of challenge that's presented to you. And, and it's just, it, it you know, like... It, to avoid it completely is is just like disingenuous. Yes. Well, I do I do blame us for this new woke culture. Mm. I really do. I think that we we have failed the fitness space for so long at helping people and I would I would argue that 100%. I would argue that many of the people in the fitness industry are more motivated to have success personally and build their business and make money than they are truly after helping people. And that has been been the, the way for the last few decades in the fitness space. And so we have failed the masses at truly helping them get to the root cause of, of problems like this. Mm -hmm. So that's why articles like this and people can come out and make this case is that look at, here's all the research to show that We've known about diet. We've known about exercise. We've known about all these things. We've got all these professionals that are helping supposedly all these people, but they're really not helping all these people. Yeah. So, so let's just abandon it. Well, yeah. I mean, now that's not me defending this, you know, idea of no personal responsibility. Well, either. you're actually taking some responsibility. That's right. Yes. I, I I feel somewhat responsible for this because I, I feel like this is a response to us not doing a good job. I agree mm. with you because I think mainstream, mm. uh, when I say mainstream, I mean the one the, the the segment of the fitness industry and space that's like popular right so if you look at like there's a there's a by the way like biggest loser yes like most trainers most personal trainers who've been doing it for a while in gyms and in studios sincerely care and do a damn good job yeah and giving a good message problem yes. is nobody knows who they are that's right that's the thing when you look at the popular trainers the ones that the the, the household names the celebrity trainers when you look at the the popular workout programs, the ones that sell you know half a billion dollars of of, of these workout programs, workout equipment, you know this this the workout pill, the diet pills, like that's the mainstream side of the fitness space. They have totally failed, and mm. they've sold it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. They've communicated the wrong message. Actually, they've fed into the wrong things. That's right. They fed into these insecurities. Totally. And these woke people now are, are picking up on it. They're realizing it. Like, oh, we've been fed a bunch of lies. Yeah, it doesn't and, work. And peddled a bunch of shit, and this is the response to that. Now, right. I yeah. don't agree with it. Right. And I think it's an overcorrection yes. and completely wrong. Oh, I totally see that. Yeah. But I also, I understand. I totally. understand because we have, we failed them for so right. many decades. It, yeah, it's a loud response to that. Like, it's not working. What, what you guys are pushing on us isn't working. And so, you, you know, now it's just like, even even more necessary that they get truth get presented to right them here. Okay, so go to the oh, the Biggest Loser is a great example. Okay, uh, we've talked at, at nauseum uh, that the, their methods are wrong. It's going to cause the weight gain. It's going to slow down people's metabolisms, hammer the hormones. Doesn't address the root cause of anything. We've talked about that at at nauseum. But here's what really used to bother me about that show: you'd watch the show and you'd see Jillian Michaels blasting this obese person on a treadmill. The biggest loser, Shay. What are you thinking right now? You thinking, what the f have I done? Aren't you, Shay? Six, five, Danny, let go. Shay, get the f up. Get up, lazy. Yeah. You gotta fucking do it. Now they're doing it not for the person, it's for the audience. Mm -hmm. And then you have people watching TV like, yeah, fucking hammer that <laughs> lazy person. <laughs> yeah, they deserve it. They're I know it's 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 uh it's pretty disgusting, actually. Yeah. It's terrible, yeah. right? And but that's the mainstream. And then you have other trainers, and this is the minority, not the majority, but there are a minority of trainers that actually believe that. They're they're fit. They look good mainly because they're insecure themselves. They have yeah. their own body image issues. So then they get someone who hires them and they're like, this is what works for me. Yeah. Hate yourself. Yeah. Do nothing but work out. Yeah. Like eat like all a, motivation yeah. hype. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and then that re results in more problems. So I, I'm so glad you said that, Adam, because mm. and this was like, this was the this was actually our goal when we started Mind Pump was yeah. like we need to like 
reverse this or or get to the point where maybe we become mainstream so at least we're the counter can have a conversation around yes it. Right, so right. we could be the counter around well, that and as far as a conversation then i want let's have a conversation around why this you know woke fitness is going to be unhealthy right mm -hmm. now first thing i want to do is i want to address that that girl's post which is silly people have their own preferences because they're attracted to what they are and what they're not and it's none of your damn business yeah <laughs> it's none of your damn business <laughs> could you imagine a guy by the way let's just reverse this <laughs> Imagine if a guy was at a club and he was talking to a girl and he's like, hey, you want to like, let's go hook up or whatever. She's like, no, leave me alone. And he's like, ah, it's because you don't, you know, like, and he uses the same exactly. tactic, exactly. like a creep. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you must, you must not be into guys yeah. then. You look whatever. creepy. Oh, well, you got to like creepy guys. Yeah. yeah. Or so, know, like we're humans too. Yeah. That's silly. People are attracted to what they're attracted to. Do. It's, it's not fat phobia or whatever. Uh, uh, anything that appears to be, by the way, this is evolutionary, unhealthy. Uh, tends people tend to be unattracted to. That's just whatever. But people have their preferences. I don't care. You Not like to mention, like most I think most surveys even show that like guys like curvy, thicker, thicker women. Most yeah. guys don't like their uh, their right. women buff and lean. And, and there ripped. is a market for that. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like it's to just have a blanket statement that everybody needs to like the same thing is ridiculous. Yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. But that's also part of this whole like you know kind of woke you know fitness movement. And then the, the other we part gotta homogenize everything. Yeah, and the other part of it is it's not your responsibility. It's not your fault. It's everybody else's fault and there's nothing you can do that'll change it um and loving yourself means being this way this is all uh, totally yeah, and false. accepting it totally false right so let's start with the first thing that i think is counter to this kind of like woke uh fitness message number one at the end of the day ultimately your health is your responsibility no one else's it's your responsibility and the sooner you realize this the better off you are now this doesn't mean that you can solve all of your health problems. That's right. And it doesn't mean there's not some people that have more challenges than others. Right. But at the end of the day, you are the only that's it's your body, it's your health. It's not anybody else's responsibility. It's not anybody's responsibility to pay for your health, to tell you what to do. Nobody's forcing things into your mouth or forcing other situations. And I know there's some situations that are far more challenging than others. Obviously, if you grow up in a, a household where you learn to eat a particular way. Mm -hmm. Well, the challenge is now kind of deconstructing that behavior, and that's a very challenging thing to do. It's extremely right. hard to do. But at the end of the day, the only way that you'll ever, first of all, it feels empowered. You're empowered when you realize it's your responsibility. You don't feel disempowered. Yeah. Even, you know, they've done studies where they've actually put people in cages and they've given them a sense of autonomy. And then they've had people in cages and they make them feel like they have no control whatsoever. The people who feel at least some sense of autonomy, far better off mentally, far better off. In fact- Yeah, the health markers are way better. In fact, when you read books of, on POWs who are like they're trapped forever, yeah. they say- The ones one that get out are the ones that had the hope and stuff. Yeah, you got you to gotta give yourself that sense of like, I, okay, at least I can control this. And this mm -hmm. is my, my, it is my responsibility with my attitude and I can at least you know do these things. And they do much, they fare much better because here's the deal- even if you believe your health is your responsibility and doesn't fix anything, just feeling that is empowering and is better for you than feeling like you're out of control and everybody else you know, controls your health and has nothing to do with you. So it is your responsibility. Accept it. I'm not saying it's easy, but accept it. If my health is poor, it's my responsibility to see if I can help myself figure this solution out or, you know, find the solution, seek help or seek help or research, you know, and, and, and find these things. You know, I've had clients where they've had to go from doctor to, I mean, very challenging situations where they've had to go from doctor to doctor to doctor to like for years to figure out what the hell is wrong with them. But they never gave up because they're like, this is my responsibility. It's my health. Yeah. And then eventually a couple of years later, found out that there was a weird genetic issue that could be solved by supplementing with a particular amino acid or whatever. Yeah. And it's solved, you know, there is not just going to like fall on your lap. It's just not going to work out like that. You got to really like take ownership responsibility of yourself and, and, and your own efforts in that direction. And that's just the bottom line. Yes. Why do yes. you think this, this argument is so appealing to people? It's always appealing for somebody to say you're, you're absolved of responsibility. It's very appealing, right? Like, let's say you, you know, you you you, bet you went bankrupt, or you broke a law, you went to jail, or it's the market's fault. It's this fault. It's yeah, like, it's easier yeah. To point the finger. Yeah, like because you because accepting responsibility feels uh, hard, and it feels like, oh man, if I do that, now I have to admit that I had I played a role in that, and, and and that's tough. But I promise you, on the other end of that is way better than 
than saying it's none of nothing is my responsibility. But it totally is. I mean, think about kids. Like it's by the way, the stra- things that work on kids. You know, it's oftentimes same thing with adults. Like, imagine if you have kids in front of you and you just keep telling them that eh, it's not your fault. Ah, eh, don't worry. This is it's yeah. totally not your fault. You, none of this stuff is your, your teacher's fault. fault. Yeah. It's the yeah, it's the school's fault. It's everybody else's fault. It's yeah. not you. Yeah, why won't anybody play with me? I have no friends, you know? Right. And it's like, listen, you're you're a jerk. You well, hit people. It's it's those parents <laughs> that mean, ra- hey, it's those parents that raise these kids that are writing these fucking articles. Bro. <laughs> those are the parents that I mean bro that's you, exactly what they're trace it back. That's yeah, exactly right. That's you what, are I mean that is that is a very true statement. Like yeah. think about the you know the whole like every kid gets a trophy mm-hmm. when you're playing a game do you know how important it is to know to lose <laughs> yeah <laughs> when you're when you're a kid yeah yeah it's not it, it hurts your kid cries it sucks whoa that is an important lesson to learn because life is going to hand you shit like yeah. that all the time we're not all built the same yeah you, you know and it's okay and then that's the thing celebrate diversity i celebrate all the time that there's differences in everybody and that should be more elevated uh than you know cut down you know my my godson is in a, a monastery school and they were i was talking to um oh my, montessori oh it's not monastery yeah Mon- montessori i think I sorry right? yeah oh, of course i fucked it up it's all right Mont- <laughs> montessori. <laughs> montessori not sari yeah. sorry that's right montessori school mm-hmm. Uh, and they they were telling me like the way they the way they teach um, to play and what they call it work and they separate them in groups and they actually I thought this and she doesn't like this, this is why she was sharing with me she goes um, the kids don't have to share if they don't want to share yeah. they're allowed to say I'm not done with it I'm in my personal space beautiful and the other kid can't come in and can't do that mm-hmm. no I don't know if that is beautiful to teach them that they don't have to share and, and play and, and, and not have to go through the challenge of working it out with a kid And so I've talked to Jessica well, about this two, yeah, okay go ahead I, so, okay so uh, sorry to cut you off yeah. I, I think uh, you, you tell your kid you don't have to share but here's what's going to happen if you don't. And then they see nobody wants to play with exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah. Nobody wants to share their toys. They, they, they got to find out the consequences of that. Yeah. And, and this is where it's like the mandating of the, you know, the teacher like, all, or the parent is, oh, you have to share. You always have to give away your stuff. And, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, allow them to be an individual that mm. can discern, you know, like, I don't want to do that. So, you know, but they, they don't learn what happens as a result of not sharing. Yeah, yeah. totally. It's like when you force your kid to say sorry. Yeah, you know what I mean. Say sorry. Like, what, what does it mean if they if they're yeah, yeah. if they're forced to say it, right? Yeah, yeah. But then they have to learn the resp- the like the the consequences of those of those types of actions, mm-hmm. just like losing in a game of you know basketball or soccer or yeah. something like that, like or getting a bad grade on a test. I've, I've had this conversation with my kids where they'll 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 get a test back and it comes back. My daughter especially, she's very competitive, very like I need to do a good job. She'll get a test back be very upset because it's not the score that she wanted. And I'll say, well, you know, what do you think you could have done to get a better grade? And she'll, I, I did work real hard. I, said, I know you did, but do you think there's anything you could have done to get a better grade? Do you think you might have done better if you studied harder or did it a little longer? And we've had these conversations. And I tell her, you, you might not want to do those things. It might be too much time, in which case that's fine. But if you're upset, you need to understand, you know, maybe there was something you could have done to change that. And that just empowers you as an adult, I think, especially when you learn that yeah, you know, yeah. as a kid. No. Uh, the next one that I think is important to understand is they're starting to define obesity as a disease. I think that's a mistake mm-hmm. because that moniker uh, comes along with the the no responsibility behind it, right? Like, I ha- was born with this disease. Like, it's a, you know, I, it's, it's a disease, you know, I, I, it's not my fault type of deal. That's the problem I have. And I know what they say. Obesity is a disease because it impairs your movement and it affects all these other things. Mm-hmm. Definitely contributes to disease. But obesity in and of itself, I don't think is a disease. A disease and I think that's a, a, a not a smart way to present it to people. Well, it's just it's just a small percentage of the population, too, that have like these like – a one-off situation where they they have this this gene that uh, it makes it extremely difficult for them, yeah. and you're lumping the masses into that group because that's the thing that's so hard with this. Is there exceptions to the rule with everybody that we're talking to? I think there's always going to be an exceptions rule. There's mm. always going to be somebody that has something that isn't that isn't something they can control. Right. But when we speak to the masses like this to to say, oh, you know. We can't say that everybody can control this one situation. Therefore, every, everybody gets to be excused of the responsibility. That's the real dangerous part about yeah. this. Like, I think you can be very empathetic that and, and understanding that there are 
people out there that have certain conditions and challenges that they can't do anything about. And it's, and right. it's unfortunate and it's unfair, but because that half of a percent of the population that might have that, that, that condition or that situation, now we're going to write articles and we're going to promote a message out there that gets the whole masses to believe like, Oh, right. I think I'm, I'm that I mean, person. It just seems like another way to diffuse or defer the responsibility back on it. I can, I actually have a handle on this. I can control my lifestyle habits that, you know, will reflect a healthier a version of myself versus I have a disease that, uh, you know, was passed on to me. And so I just eat this way. Cause that's part of like who I am. Do you yeah. remember when this, when this gained traction, like when, when they started saying that, cause it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't. And, and, and here's the problem with it is that let's say you, you have a disease now health insurance, uh, treats you for that disease in a particular way. Your employer, treats you a certain way because you have a disease. So maybe you get more time off, you get, you're excused from doing certain things because of this, you know, disease that you have. So when you label just obesity right. as a disease, now you could, by the way, and here's, here's the thing that this is actually quite true. You can be obese. And although being obese by itself is less healthy than not being obese, all other things being considered, you can still be obese and not necessarily be unhealthy, super unhealthy. Like mm -hmm. you can be fit and fat, right? Um, now, again, if you're fit and lean versus fit and fat, the same individual is probably healthier being fit and lean, but you can be overweight, have a high BMI and not have diabetes, not have black, you know, bad blood lipids, not have, you know, you know, cholesterol issues or blood pressure issues. Well, and those are all the physiological things. There's mental things too, yeah, and yeah. relationships, and uh, you know, financial health. There's other things that uh, that encompass health. So you could have all those other ones. You check in the boxes on that, but you carry a little extra body fat. Right. So mm -hmm. my point is, like, just because your BMI is high, now your employer says, "Oh, this person has a disease." Even though that disease, you know, obesity itself may not necessarily impair you mm -hmm. with other stuff. Now, obesity leads to diseases, and that's a totally different story. But just saying obesity itself is a disease is a problem. And what will start happening is that people who are obese will start getting treated with particular privileges that people with diseases tend to get treated with. And this might even cause some kind of a strange incentive for people to have this, you know, this, this right. Stuff. And uh, I mean, like to your point of, of being excused from things, I think that, that, that could kind of go in hand with this in terms of like even physical education. Well, I don't like it, you know, and I, I want to sit this out because it, you know, my disease like makes me feel, uh, you know, like my heart races too much and, and I feel dizzy. And, and so I'm just not going to do this, this activity at all, uh, because of my disease. Well, the, the next, the next point that I think of is this, this whole, uh, self love movement has gone I feel like extreme. So twisted. Yeah. They like, twisted it. Like it's, it's become this like that all, okay, we can't, we cannot love ourselves and then equal also be able to say, I'm not taking care of myself. Correct. Like it, it, you can't, why can't you do that? Why can't I say that? Hey, I love, I love who I am. I, I love everything about myself, but I also know I've been making some bad choices. I haven't been taking good care of myself. Yeah. And because of that, my body and my health reflected. Yeah. I remember mm. when we interviewed Bishop Barron and he talked about the, de like what love was. And he says, a lot of people think love is a feeling he goes, love is actually an action. It's how you treat, like, uh, like you know, you have family members that you don't always feel love for. Sometimes you might actually not like them, yeah. but you choose to do things for them, to be there for them because you're doing the action of love, right? Real love is hard and tough. It's nothing, there's nothing easy about real love. And I think every parent understands every that. Every parent knows yeah. that. So yeah. it would be like me being like, you know, I'm a, a, a cocaine addict. Yeah. Uh, why are you cocaine addicts, Al? I'm loving myself right now. Like you're actually not loving yourself. Right, it feels good to do all that cocaine, yeah. but you're not loving well, yourself right I now. I would just feed my kids jelly beans all day. You know, like I just that's what they want. So give it to them. Right. Why? Why should I do any different? Like what? Yeah, why should I have barriers? Why should I create? Uh, you know, like healthy habits and things for them to to abide by. Uh, they're they're gonna fight me on it, and they do fight me all the way through. But why should I stick to the fight, dude? I had a client once, uh, very successful, whose son uh, started getting uh, having developing issues with drugs, and eventually, and it was very tough for her. She's like, I had to cut him off because I had to create a, like a bottom for him so that he could start to figure Otherwise I was supporting him by having him live with us and giving him, you know, money and paying for things. 
And uh, it actually helped. The kid finally seeked out therapy and, and, you know, helped himself out. But she had to do what they call tough love, right? She had to love him enough to do the thing that was very challenging. Real love is is real. It's, a, it's, it's you know, you can say to yourself, look, I, I, I do love myself. I don't always act like I do, though. Like, I definitely do things that are that are not taking care of me. You know, sometimes I I drink too much or I, I'm not active and I can feel it in my body and my joints and I'm not really caring for my and by the way, that's okay. We don't always care for ourselves perfectly all the time. I'm I'm in the fitness space and I can tell you I don't do that all the time. But they have to be kind of real about it. What they did is they took this self-love acceptance message and they twisted it yeah. to where uh, you know, doing whatever you want or whatever feels good. That's what that's what it is. Doing whatever feels good means that's self love. So yeah. even though it's causing severe obesity, it's causing my health to decline, my mobility. I can't move like I used to. I don't feel good. My sleep is affected. Whatever. Well, that's me loving myself. It's actually not. You're not actively loving yourself well, uh, when you're doing that. You know, it, I mean, Justin brought up the jelly beans and, and things and, the, and giving the kids what they want, which sometimes I feel like that's kind of a hard um, comparison to draw for some of these people that are trying to figure this out. And as we're talking about it, the first thing that comes to mind that I think relates to this the most or where I struggled with something very similar myself, um, for a long time in my my uh, up into my late 20s, um, I would bail my my mom out and my family out financially. Mm. So if you know, got behind on, on bills, this or that, and Hey, we're family, right? We're family. I love my mom. I would never, I, I'd love my sister and brother and I would, I would, you know, get them out of it. Like, you know, Hey, they're behind on this, they're behind on that, like catch them up. And then it was just, and it, that's been a part of my life since I was a young kid. I've been helping out financially since as long as I could work and make any money. And I remember I was training a client one time that was a psychologist and, and he was talking to me about, uh, the, and I was struggling and I would, you know, talk to him. We had a good relationship. I would vent about it. Like, oh, you know, I just, I did this for my mom and this, and then I see her go out and she does this and does that. He goes, you know, Adam, I know you think that you giving her money is because you love her, but you need to reframe that. And he goes, if you really loved her, you would say no. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's not how she makes me feel. She makes me feel if I say, no, I'm the worst son. We said, well, yeah, it's hard, you know, but you continuing to give her money and bail out all the time like that is you're actually crutching and you're actually hurting her more. Mm -hmm. And so I had to reframe the way I looked at it. And I tell you, it was the hardest transition ever yeah. to go. Of course, you I know, totally get that. You know, and say that. So I know that there, there's people that are in this position, right? It's, it's very hard when you're in this situation to, to, to be able to say that to yourself and, and to do that. But again, to Sal's point of that's, that's attributing it to the feeling only, you, you know, love is the feeling of it because it does feel good when your kids are excited about giving yes. them treats like, Oh, I'm giving them love. Oh, give me a hug. You know, and then they're much more likely to, uh, you know, respond that way versus, you know, giving them something that they're, you, you know, you know that their body's going to benefit from it, but they're going to have all kinds of pushback. And, and, and we're always, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. Cause sometimes you want that. Like I, I want, I, I seek that out. I want to hug and I want to have everybody happy and in a good mood. And, um, you know, and it sucks to, you know, to, to be able to be the person that that does apply the tough love, but then uh, you know, there's all, all, of course there's a balance there as well. So you got to recognize yeah, that's right. I, love is not always easy. No, yeah. it's 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 hard. I I went through the same thing. I went through like what you're talking about, Justin. Man, after I got divorced, you know, and then I and we did did this kind of dual custody thing, right, where the kids are half with their mom, half with me. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, did I struggle with that because yeah. of the I wanted them just to be happy. Right. Right. Because we just got divorced. Now they got to live in two houses and yeah. I'm feeling really bad about that for them. And, and I just wanted them to be happy. So for like a year, whatever they wanted, they got, I'd buy them shit. They eat whatever they want. Like it's fun time all the time. Yeah. And then it, it, after a while, I was realizing like, this is not, this is just me wanting them to feel good, but I'm not really helping them by doing, that's not what real life is about. I'm not really acting like I love them. I'm just acting like I'm afraid that they'll have bad feelings, mm -hmm. which, which really wasn't good. It was a big, it was a very challenging struggle. I'll tell you what, this point about self-love was, this is what I focused on the most with my clients who ch were challenged with obesity because this was the most important one. This was the one that if we could figure out 
And, and, and oftentimes we did, especially later on in my career when I got much better at communicating this. Once we figured it out, what naturally happened is people naturally developed a sense of balance, right? Because if you really love yourself in the truest sense, in the hard sense as well, then, and let's say you're obese, what you're probably going to do is most of the time, you're probably going to have tough love with yourself, with your diet, right? Because you're used to eating a particular way. Maybe, this isn't true for everyone, but let's just say maybe food is your comfort for you. It's how you deal with, let's say, stress uh, or bad feelings. So your food has become kind of a drug. This is quite common. And so now you have to have this tough love with yourself and say, this way that you make yourself feel better, we're going to have to take this away. Uh, for a little while, and it's not going to feel good. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really, really hard, right? So most of the time, you'll probably do that. But then, if you're actually loving yourself in the truest sense, the occasional moment will come up where you'll be like, okay, I have been taking care of myself. I have been eating in a way that that cares for my body. Mm -hmm. It's been very difficult. I've been doing this now for two months. My sister's coming to visit tomorrow. I haven't seen her in a while. Uh, she she makes this incredible chicken pot pie that we and we used to eat when we were kids. And you know what? This day, what's healthy for me is to connect with my sister. We're going to eat the chicken pot pie. We're going to have a glass of wine. And you get this natural balance. And what doesn't happen is a binge. Yeah. The binge doesn't happen because the binge comes from false self-love where you finally go off this diet because you're like, I can't take it anymore, right? right? And then you go way off in the wrong direction. Well, you, ha you have to address, uh, and, you, and I think you do it so well, um, Self-image versus body image. Absolutely. Because this is where I think people get hung up here. You, they confuse they think, the two. They, that's right. They think they're the same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, no. Your self-image is like, am I a person worthy of being taken care of? Uh, am I a human worthy of some dignity, some respect? Um, or, you know, I have some good qualities to me. I'm not a bad person. Body image is just objective. I look in the mirror. I'm short. I'm tall. Uh, I'm hairy. Uh, I'm, you know, bald or I'm fat or I'm overweight and yeah. I haven't been taking care of myself or I'm underweight because I haven't been taking care of myself or my digestion is off because I haven't, that's objective, but that doesn't define your, who you are in terms of yourself, right? I can look in the mirror and say, you know, man, I've, I, I've been uh, not taking care of myself with food. Uh, it's been not really good. That doesn't make me a bad person. Jeez, for fuck's sake. Like we all do shit to ourselves. That isn't good. So it's okay. You need to have empathy with yourself um, and forgive yourself. And that's important because if you don't, then you'll end up uh, hating yourself through food, which looks probably the way that you're eating now if you're struggling with this. So you need to forgive yourself. Like, okay, like be empathetic. Like, okay, I know it's hard. This has been tough. I haven't been taking care of myself. I'm a good person. Like that's the difference. It's not, oh my God, I, I don't look good. I'm a bad person. I don't deserve care, love, or any of that stuff. When you confuse self-image with body image or self-image with other objective things, then you then you really have a, a problem. Then it becomes a real big challenge yeah, for yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I used to tell my clients to look at it and just say, instead of looking at it like, oh, I'm fat or this, that, look at it like, boy, I've been really enjoying myself lately. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a lot of stored energy, you know? Yeah. Like, that's how I would tell them to Let's communicate. put it to use. Like, yeah. Well, instead of it being like negative, like looking at yourself in the yeah. mirror and going like, I'm fat or, right, you know, right. or I'm these things, it's just like, wow, I've been really enjoying myself and I've got all this extra stored energy that I need to put to use. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. So reframing even how you look at Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, the next one, this is an important one now is that obesity, this is the objective, scientific, 100% truth, is not healthy. Okay, Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have okay health and be obese. This doesn't mean that you can be lean and have poor health. Of course, you can be lean and have This part's been under attack, I feel like, the most. Yes. Late. What it means is all other factors controlled, all other factors considered. You know, if I took somebody who was healthy, lean, and I just added 50 pounds of body fat on their body. So everything else is the same. They just have an additional 50 pounds of body fat. Their health has become worse because of that extra body fat. So lots of body fat, very inflammatory on the body. It's uh, it's a hormone-sensitive tissue. Obviously adds non-functional uh, weight to your body, meaning I'm now 50 pounds heavier, but it's not 50 pounds of functional it's muscle. It's not working for me, yeah. Yeah, so I'm gonna, my joints are being worn out, that kind of stuff. Now, this is another one that I'm going to take uh, the stance that it's our fault again. Mm. So, and I really, uh, I, I really didn't realize how much this was our fault 
until I got into the competing space. Because these are when you when you look at that that little bubble of people, right? That one percent that, that get on stage and compete. These are they are the representation of the magazines. So yes, the, the TV stars, the magazines, like They're most the, the sexy, hot, fit, and healthy. Bodies. That's right. Yeah. They are the ones that are on all the magazine covers that everybody talks about. That have millions of followers on on social media. They are a representation of the fitness space right now. Yeah. And until I got into it. I did not know just how unhealthy they were. Yeah. Right. And so I can't blame this this woke fitness culture right now for taking this stance about you know being able to be obese and still unhealthy because if you compare them to those people, yeah. there are a lot. In fact, I've probably met more obese or very overweight people that are actually even healthier than these. Uh, yeah, that portrayal is what they're getting. Like that, that's what they're looking at in terms of uh, okay, if I have to really work on myself, I got to get myself to this kind of condition, this kind of shape. Like uh, I, I've seen what they do. I see you. They bring the bags with them everywhere. They're neurotic about it like they don't want like their their relationships suffer as a result of it like all these types of things very it's very visibly obvious and and you know somewhere along you know the the spectrum uh you know we're just skipping right past all these like normal people i don't even know if it's very visibly obvious because i was fooled by it yeah. you know yeah i know that I and mean, we can make the case that all oh, these people are addicted to working out but they can also make make the case that that just they love what they do right so that's not that's not a good enough case for me where they fall short is all the other parts yeah. of health, right? The, the being so self-absorbed, being massively insecure of that's what really drives mm -hmm. them, having terrible relationships, abusing drugs to get to that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many other markers that tell you how healthy you are or not are so out of whack. Yeah, they have this one in place, the exercise mm -hmm. and diet restriction. They've got that one in place, but all the rest. And I'm and I'm sure people that are writing these articles are woke they woke the fuck up and they saw they went oh my god i've met enough of these knuckleheads mm -hmm. and i've got i got this this left group of friends that there's 10 of these bodybuilders and then i have my right obese friends and you know what when i hang out with my fat friends mm -hmm. they actually have a better balance of life and they actually have a better relation yeah better relationship with money better relationship with their partner better relationship yep. with their family you know have better balance in their life better at i mean you start seeing that you go like whoa Okay, well, obese mm -hmm. can be health. It could definitely be healthier than the people right now that we've been praising as the healthiest in the space. Yeah, no, yeah, that's a, sure. it's such a good point. If you look at all of the representations of health that we have in mainstream media, what is it? It's uh, uh, professional athletes. It's mm -hmm. uh, models, right? Good looking, sexy people. Um, you don't see a single gray hair on any woman over the age of thirty in any of these, uh, you know, models or fitness professionals. Everything looks perfect. They're sculpted. They're shredded. There's, you know, uh, Photoshop and plastic surgery, whatever. And so we look at them and we think those are the representations of health. They're not. You know, I remember years ago. I'll never forget this. Right? When I early in the fitness space, when I started working in the fitness space, I was, uh, you know, I thought that I thought that it was athletes that were professional athletes. That, by the way, professional athletes are not the healthiest. They're extreme performers, and oftentimes their lifespan is shorter than the average person uh, because because of it. But I thought. Pro athletes, the healthiest. Models, healthy. Fitness, you know, fanatics, these people in magazines, super healthy. I'll never forget, there were two people in particular that really shattered my mind with this. There was this guy that came in once, and he was older gentleman. I couldn't really figure out his age. He looked like he was in his 50s when he came in. You know, gray hair, great posture, you know, really, you know, good, nice skin or whatever. And he wasn't like overly muscular or super shredded, but he looked very fit, very healthy. And he would come in and he was part of that 6 a.m. crew, right? If, when you run a gym, uh, there's there's like the same people. The people that work the out in the morning people. are the most mm -hmm. consistent. Yeah. They always show up at the same time. So anytime I was in there at 6 a.m. to audit the front desk or because we were having a closeout or whatever, I would see this guy. He'd come in. And I used to watch him work out. And I remember looking at him like, man, that guy looks amazing. You know, for, for being 50 something years old, he looks incredible. I'll never forget one day he brought his card in. I scanned it, I looked at his birthday, and I stopped him when I did the math. Oh, I said, come here. I said, when's your birthday? I'm like, is, this, is he using someone else's membership card? That's what I thought. He tells me the date. And I'm like, you're 74 years old. He goes, yeah. I'm like, hold. I said, can I shake your hand? I shook his hand. And he tells me a story of, how he, Jack LaLanne was somebody he followed and he exercised and he's like, yeah, I never abused drugs or alcohol and just something I really enjoy. And, you know, I've done this for, you know, most of my life. And I remember looking at him going, wow, that's what healthy looks like. I don't think he'd ever be on a cover of a magazine, mm. 
But that's what healthy looks like. Then it happened again later on where there was this woman that would come in and work out. And uh, I don't know if you guys ever saw her. She was at Santa Teresa and she would come in the morning. And she was just like, she was like 5'3", long silver hair. So she like total gray hair. And she'd work out and she looked uh, just very healthy and vibrant. Very vibrant. Energy, whatever. And I remember thinking, what an attractive older woman. She was also in her 70s when I met her and started talking to her. Same thing. She's like, oh yeah, you know, I just, this is just, uh, I, I love being healthy. This is a part of my life. She wasn't a fanatic, whatever. And I remember realizing like, healthy looks like that. It doesn't look like the extreme stuff that we see all the time. Yeah, right. Now the problem is also, I definitely blame the fitness industry for feeding that, but I also blame the consumer because yes. you buy, you want to buy the super sexy well, fake looking person, right? We know, we know what sells. What sells is the extremes. And we've lived through that, uh, you know, over and over again. And uh, to, to, to sort of get people to uh, understand that, you know, that isn't an extreme is a battle in itself. And, and you know, we, we've been so polarized on, you know, different ends uh, on, on anything that we, you know, any industry, I think, like they understand that to, to show something that's way more extreme is shocking and it's going to get a lot more people to yes, buy the magazine. That's right. Yes. So, and there's a range of what that's like, why I don't know health if, is. That's why I don't know if we ever win this Yeah, battle. I don't think we'll ever show like just the portrayal like you're describing. We we gotta yeah, you, do. We gotta do a better job. Well, we gotta, you know, I, I still don't. We gotta even, sell it better than they I, do. I mean, I, that's hard. I mean, there, there there will always be, I think, a space for for mind pump as far as uh, as a business because of that, that, that. There's a lot of people that want to learn or want that. So I think we're we're okay. But as far mm -hmm. as changing the whole industry, like of course we 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 thought we might our do. lofty goal. Yeah, yeah. Our lofty <laughs> goal. Do. I don't know. You know, and and when I think that when you're bringing up stuff like sports, like that's a that's a great example. Like. You know, the truth is most people don't care that they're all steroided up. Most people don't care that the cork and the bat are doing these crazy things because we want to see that. We want to see as freakish right. and as crazy. I mean, and, and bodybuilding is another example of that. Look at how it's pushed the, the envelope to these just unnatural, unhuman monsters, but we still watch. We yeah. still want to be, we still want to see it. We're still intrigued by it. Even if we all, there's not a lot of people that go like, I would want to look like that. Uh -huh. A very small percentage say that, but yet we all want to watch. Yeah. And I remember reading yeah. the lifespan of a professional football player for the first time. Yeah, 55. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I, I'm like, what? Oh, super depressing. Well, look yeah. at the lifespan of a pro NBA player. It's also lower, yeah. lower than the average, you know, uh, you know, lifespan. So, and by the way, health looks good in person, maybe not always in magazines and stuff. And there's a, there's a spectrum of that, right? Healthy people have stretch marks. Healthy people are not super shredded often, oftentimes healthy people don't look like bodybuilders or models oftentimes. Sometimes they're leaner. Sometimes they're a little heavier. Sometimes they're more muscular. Sometimes they're less muscular. But there is a spectrum within that. But what typically is not in that spectrum is obesity. Obesity, all things being considered, is just worse for you. Now, you can still be generally healthy and be obese. But if you were uh, that same health or th all those other factors are the same and not obese, your health would be better and your risk factors for disease and stuff like that would be lower. That's right. uh, now, the last one, and this one is just, uh, it's, you know, we, we, ha we have to talk about this all the time. And that's that obesity is, is it's not because of your genetics. Uh, now, there are very small, rare cases where this is the, the case. But for the vast, 99.9% .9 of us, it's not your genes. We didn't evolve uh, with obesity. You know, obesity was non-existent you know, hundreds of years ago. Yeah. It's, it's actually a relatively new modern thing. You can see the number of obese people, how much it's exploded since life has become so sedentary and since especially- It's since also a, a, attacking the, the opposite person, right? The, it used to be a rich thing. It used to be a thing that very when, true. when you were very wealthy, you had the luxury to buy that kind of food and eat that much food. So you're the only people that could get fat. That's right. And everybody else was had barely enough food to get by. Where now it's the complete opposite. You're right. Now obesity affects the poor much more. By the way, it's not because they don't have access to uh, necessarily to good food because believe it or not, there, even with processed foods, there are ways you could treat yourself and eat in a way that doesn't cause obesity. It's mainly an education issue. Yes. When people who tend to be wealthier, they tend to learn this kind of stuff and learn and see how to do it. P 
people, and I know this, I've worked in these situations, I've gone to schools, I've volunteered. The kids just have no idea. Oh, this is chicken. You know, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a bucket of Kentucky fried chicken. I thought that yeah, was healthy. Vegetables come from ketchup. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so That's a real thing. That's right. So, But genetics are not the cause. The reason why you see obesity in families isn't because of the genetic. By the way, you go back it's with those generational families. generational behaviors. It's behaviors. Yeah. You learn how to eat. You learn how to treat yourself. You learn how to be active. Uh, by the way you grow up. And and by the way, this this is almost as hard as having genetics that make you obese, which, uh, like I said, are extremely rare. It's almost as hard. Like, you can't change your genetics. It's impossible, right? You all, It's so hard to change behaviors that you grow up with. It's, it's so hard just to recognize those behaviors. I remember when I realized that my family yelled all the time. Yeah, I remember it was like, it was like a, a sh- like a, what? Nobody yeah. talks this way? Yeah. I would have friends come over for dinner and then I remember them get uncomfortable. I'd be like, what's going on? I'd be like, why is everybody yelling? <laughs> I recognize the same with my Italian friend. Yeah. I'd go stay at his house and first thing in the morning, yeah. and I would jump out of bed. Yeah. yeah. And I remember thinking like, oh, wait, this is, this yeah, is just the way I was just raised. Yes, yeah, a normal it's, thing. It's hardwired. It's, it's like stereotypes with food. Like uh, Indian people eat Indian food. Mexican people eat Mexican food. Yeah, Chinese yeah. people eat Chinese food. It's like you take any of those people and you raise them in a different country and they eat that food. You're yeah. right. And it's not because of their race they eat that type of food. I I remember having to try to explain that to clients. It's like you have learned to love all those foods and yeah. you can reteach yourself to like other ones and you can break that cycle. It's not, you're not, you're not born with it. It's not right. in your race. Right. You've, you've, you've Some been people developed. love insects. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, that's what exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in fact, if you take people uh, who are healthy and fit and lean and they live in like some of these like uh, blue zones where people live a long time and you, and you follow their, their kids, Let's say somebody, um, you know, you have someone right now that's living in Sardinia. This is one of the world's uh, blue zones where people live a long time. And then they have a kid and their kid moves to America. That kid now has the same percentage chance of becoming obese as every other American, even though they grew up in this area where everybody's super healthy. And what, And I know this, scientists have studied this because they said, what is it genetics or is it lifestyle that's making these people so healthy? And they always come back and say... It's the lifestyle. Yeah. It's not. I mean, you take people from Okinawa. You take people who have descendants from Okinawa who grow up in, in, in you know, in, in America, and they have the same chances. Especially as the generations keep going, as you become more, you become more and more part of this whatever this culture is that tends to cause obesity. You see it become much more prevalent. So it's not a genetics thing at all. And yes, genetics I, play a role. I want to say this too. Genetics play a role, but here's the, the fact about genetics. So what? You can't change it. You can't control it. Why are we focusing on that? Right. Mm-hmm. Not to mention, mm-hmm. too, the, the, the grass is always green on the other side with this genetic argument, yeah. too. Because, it, you know, you, there are people that are, are, are born with, you know, uh, typically a faster metabolism or they would fall in the somatotype of like an ectomorph body type versus a, a mesomorph or an endomorph type of body yeah. type. So, you know, which, but here's the thing. If you're uh, an ectomorph, so you're the really skinny body type, right? That's your mm-hmm. genetic potential. Your genetics are, you know, you, your body was more likely to be that way. You have a much harder time building muscle than the person who's the endomorph. An endomorph that can build muscle easier can actually potentially speed their metabolism up faster. So, yeah, they might have a harder time burning, manually burning fat, and, and so they're a little more challenged there, but then they have the advantage of being able to build muscle, which then also can turn, can speed their metabolism well, up. Well, I'll, I'll take it a step further. Let's say you are that ectomorph that that has a tough time building muscle. You just don't build muscle very easily, or not like your friend who's this genetic freak and this you know mesomorph or whatever that builds tons of muscle. But you stick to it. You train yourself. You learn. That's right. You figure them. You as the ectomorph, you probably will know how to build muscle more effectively than your friend that it came to them easily. I don't think I would have been as good of a trainer as I became if I was super genetically gifted. I'll be honest with you. A lot of stuff I had to figure out for myself too because it was really hard. Mm -hmm. Muscle and fitness didn't come easy to me. It was something I had to really work hard towards. So there's definitely you know pluses and minuses. But at the end of the day, here's the bottom line. There's a choice that you have to make in life, and that's this. Look, you can either choose to focus on the things that you can't control or you can choose to ignore those things and focus on the things that you can control. Now, does that guarantee you success? Does that guarantee you're going to win everything you try or guarantee that you're going to make tons of money or you know look super awesome or whatever? No, it doesn't guarantee any of those things. But the odds that you'll do those things are far higher when you focus on the things you can control and ignore the things you can't. So if you want to look at it like it's it's gambling, what are my odds of being successful at whatever I do? What are my odds at, at, that I fail at everything that I do? The odds are far greater 
when you accept what you can't control and focus on what you can. Mm -hmm. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com. Check out all of our free content. We've got tons of free stuff that we give people. It's really great. And again, it's free. It's awesome. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. There's kind of a difference between wanting and liking. And what scientists who kind of study people, they kind of discovered that when you get cravings for this food, the wanting goes up, but the liking doesn't necessarily go up. It can even go down. It's like we want this stuff and then we eat it and 